The Blended Video Series is based on an excellent sermon series entitled Blended, presented by Pastor Lance Lowell of Neighborhood Church in Modesto, California. This sermon series is a call for unity in the body of Christ. The theme of this video series is found in the Gospel of John. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Pastor Lowell gave me his sermon notes and encouraged me to design a video series. The episodes that you will see are a collaboration between Pastor Lowell and myself. I hope you enjoy this production. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Unity in the body of Christ is the primary goal of the Holy Spirit. The testimony we give to the world is filtered through the unity we have as a congregation. Should we want power in our testimonies, then walk in unity with the body of Christ. Our goal at Neighborhood Church is to be an effective witness to our community of our love and faith in Christ. This can only happen when we as a congregation stand united in faith and purpose. The New Testament provides a pattern that should be followed so that we can be in one accord. But the pattern is not based on the latest Vogue doctrine. It is based upon what we see in the New Testament church. We are to be in one accord, God's way. Let's begin in the book of Acts. The disciples had just experienced an amazing miracle. They saw Jesus ascend to heaven in clouds of glory. Awestruck and amazed, the disciples walked from the Mount of Olives back to Jerusalem to the upper room. According to the narrative in the book of Acts, 120 followers of Jesus Christ gathered together. Acts says that all in the upper room continued with one accord in prayer and supplication for several days. What does it mean to be in one accord? Being in one accord does not just happen. Some preliminary work must be done. Before the one accord of the upper room could occur, there must be a meeting of the minds. The ascension experience on the Mount of Olives solidified in the disciples' minds as to who Jesus Christ is. There was no doubt, Jesus was both Christ and Son of God. The disciples were one in Christ. This must be made perfectly clear. Without oneness, there can be no genuine one accord, because this type of unity comes from the oneness we have in Christ. According to the Apostle Paul, before we can have one accord, we first must be one in spirit and purpose. We at Neighborhood Church strongly believe in the need to be one in spirit and purpose. 
In order to have this type of unity, we must be open to the working of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to walk in oneness with the body of Christ? Paul said that we must make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. There is only one body and one spirit, but there is also one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father. This is essential. We all must maintain the same basic beliefs. It would be difficult to be in one accord with people who deny the very basics of our faith. Paul also emphasized in the epistle to the Philippians that true spiritual oneness has enemies, and they are selfish ambition and vain conceit. Sometimes we leave congregations because our personal kingdom building was frustrated. Sometimes we join a congregation with a selfish ambition to build our own little kingdom. Personal kingdom building of any kind is a stumbling block to the body life and unity being manifest by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Here at Neighborhood Church, we strive for the unity of the congregation. Please check your personal kingdom at the door when you enter. Our goal at Neighborhood Church is to be an effective witness to our community of our love and faith in Christ. This can only happen when we as a congregation stand united in faith and purpose. We value the cultures and life experiences we all have. But these personal agendas should not disrupt the unity of our congregation. We are encouraged in the Bible to keep the oneness of spirit in the bonds of unity and peace. The walk down from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem was the time when the disciples became of one mind. They had one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. They were united in vision and purpose. Selfish ambition and personal kingdom building died with Judas Iscariot. They were now ready to be in one accord. The one accord is the practical working out of the oneness that we share in Christ. We see this one accord in our church services, in our functions in the church, and in our handling of relationships with the members at Neighborhood Church and the body of Christ at large. One accord is what people see when they observe believers at Neighborhood Church. Oneness in faith is the hidden source of our one accord. Oneness is what we are baptized into when we accept the Lordship of Jesus Christ. As Paul said to the Ephesians, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, 
who is over all and through all and in all. Being in one accord is the goal we strive for at Neighborhood Church. Should you join our congregation, then being in one accord must also be your goal. We must be diligent to keep the oneness of spirit in the bond of peace. Consider this thought. Only after Jesus breathed upon the disciples did they receive the Holy Spirit and were able to pray in one accord. Prior to this event, the disciples were constantly comparing themselves to one another. Who was the greatest was their constant debate. Each disciple sought his own personal agenda. Selfish ambition frustrated the working of the Holy Spirit to produce a oneness of mind. Selfish ambition and greed reached such a point that Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. The one accord of the upper room could not happen without true oneness in spirit and purpose. What can happen when we are in one accord God's way? 3,000 souls can be saved through the preaching of a simple message. Just remember, the church is called to carry the mantle of unity. Then returned they unto Jerusalem, from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath's day journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode Peter, and James, and John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. The number of names together were about a hundred and twenty. Ten days before Pentecost, the disciples of Christ gathered in the upper room. These eleven disciples had a mission. They were to remain in Jerusalem until they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1 verse 15, we see that nearly 120 people gathered in the upper room. This is confusing. I thought the command to remain in Jerusalem was only given to the eleven apostles that Jesus had chosen. What happened? Why do we see 120 people in the upper room? Something happened on the Mount of Olives. The eleven went to the Mount as Christ's disciples, but left the Mount as Christ's brethren. The oneness of mind had formed. The eleven may not have realized but the first new steps of the body of Christ were forming on their way back to Jerusalem. The upper room experience displays a subtle truth that is often overlooked. In traditional Judaism, women do not mix with men in religious expression. Jewish men gather together but pray separate from the women. The fact that women were in the upper room is a prelude to a spiritual experience not bound by old Jewish traditions. 
also notice that Jesus' own physical brothers and mother were in the room. This may not seem strange, but remember, his own brothers didn't believe in him. We read that the 120 were in one accord. This could only happen with the breaking of old Jewish traditions and beliefs. This assortment of personalities and gender became the epicenter for the greatest spiritual experience in all history, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The key to the success of the upper room is that all 120 were in one accord. They were of the same mind and purpose. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. In the upper room, we see three keys that were necessary for the disciples to be in one accord. Let's consider these keys. The first key is to be devoted to the kind of prayer that invites the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 1 says that all in the upper room were in one accord and continually engaged in prayer and supplication. Dr. William Mounts, an expert in New Testament Greek, suggests in his Greek translation of the New Testament that all the 120 devoted themselves with a single purpose to prayer. The first thing to observe is that everyone was engaged. All the occupants of the upper room, not just a few quiet members. The Greek word used in this verse for devoted means much more than a casual exercise in prayer. The word means to engage in an activity with perseverance and constant diligence, to do something with intense effort even though the activity might be difficult. The people in the upper room were not half-hearted. They were fully engaged in prayer. The very fact that they were in one accord indicates that they had a single purpose. They were of the same mind and passion. Simply stated, they had one agenda, and that agenda was prayer. Everyone checked their personal agendas at the door. The occupants of the upper room did not engage in vain, repetitious prayer. That's seen in the synagogues and on street corners. The disciples understood from the teachings of Jesus that prayer was much more than spoken words. It is a spiritual relationship with God. It is communal in nature and filled with worship. The prayer these humble saints prayed invited God to rule in their situation. They wanted God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Pastor Jack Hayford coined an interesting phrase, God can, 
but he won't unless we do. We must realize that we are an integral part to the process of the kingdom of God being established on earth. These early believers understood that they were absolutely necessary to the mission to evangelize the earth. The mission has not changed. We are still an integral part to the kingdom of God being established on earth. What transpired in the upper room for the 10-day period from the ascension to the Feast of Pentecost? No one knows for sure. Maybe the Apostle Paul can give some insight. It's possible that during this prolonged season of prayer, the 120 were struggling with the full armor of God. Maybe they wrestled with dark spiritual forces in the heavenly realm, because the day was coming shortly that they would need to stand their ground and proclaim the gospel of Christ to an unbelieving world. This is important because prayer was not the strong suit of the eleven. They couldn't even pray with Jesus for one hour in the Garden of Gethsemane. Who knows what issues were dealt with in prayer? What spiritual forces of evil they wrestled with during this ten-day prayer session? Who knows for sure, but I believe that Jesus not only prepared his disciples for the Holy Spirit, he also put on them the armor of God. It is important we realize that prayer does not change the mind and heart of God. Prayer is designed to shape our heart and mind around his purpose. Through prayer, we set aside our agendas and our own personal kingdoms to see the kingdom of God established. We at Neighborhood Church invite all who attend to be in one accord with our mission and purpose. We invite you to the kind of prayer that invites the kingdom of God. The second key we see displayed in the upper room is the humility we see in Jesus Christ. Keep in mind the context of the upper room experience. Not that long in the past, the disciples partook of the Last Supper with Jesus. When we harmonize the four Gospels, we see an interesting narrative that occurs at the Last Supper. According to Luke, a dispute arose among the disciples as to who was the greatest. What an arrogant thing to talk about. Why would such a dispute happen? This dispute must be viewed in the light of the Jewish custom of feet washing as a sign of hospitality. Since the Israelites wore sandals instead of shoes, they usually went barefoot in the house. Frequent washing of feet was necessary. Hence, the custom evolved that it was necessary for the host of a banquet to wash the feet of his guests. To fail to perform this ritual was considered an insult and viewed as unfriendly. In rabbinic literature, the wife was expected to render this service to her husband, but at a banquet, the host would instruct a slave to perform the ritual. 
it would be considered a very humbling and demeaning experience to wash the feet of the guests in attendance. Therefore, all the disciples disputed as to who would perform this custom. None of the disciples wanted to consider themselves as the least important. Jesus, understanding the insecurity and pride of his disciples, assumed the role of a slave and washed the feet of his disciples. The ritual the disciples refused to perform, fighting for social position, was the service Jesus performed as an example. Let's read. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. After the ritual, Jesus said, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus demonstrated the power of humility in a way that will not be forgotten ever. Even to this day, we see the example of humility on display during the Last Supper. John tells his readers that Jesus knew he had authority over all things and that he came from God and was soon to return. Jesus, who knew he was from God, emptied himself and became a man. He took off his robe of royalty and tied around his waist the towel of a servant. I am sure that the example set by Jesus reverberated in the upper room. We do not see any one disciple exalting his or her own self-importance, but they are bound together in one accord, seeking the face of Jesus. Something happens when we pray and serve in one accord. We humble ourselves and serve each other in unity. The disputes of self-importance fall away in the light of such humility. When we join to a local congregation, let the admonishment of Paul be our personal motto. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Should you desire to join the fellowship at Neighborhood Church, please practice humility when you come through our doors.
The third key we see displayed in the upper room is obedience to the command of Jesus Christ. What command are we speaking of? The only command that really matters, the Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What happened in the upper room was Jesus preparing his disciples to fulfill his great commission. Pentecost was God giving the tools to the disciples to preach the gospel to all nations including Gentiles. It took nearly 10 years from the day of Pentecost for the Holy Spirit to crack open the religious traditions of the Jews to accept an influx of Gentile believers. But the early Jewish Christians eventually accepted the fact that the Great Commission would be open to all nations and peoples. Just remember, obedience opens the door to God's miraculous works. When you come through the doors of our church, please understand that God has given a mission to Neighborhood Church. Don't ignore what God is doing among us, but seek to join in. What can we glean from the upper room experience that we can use today? Before we can be in one accord, we first must be one in spirit and purpose. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you are called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. On this foundation we can build. We can blend. We can be in one accord God's way.